Well, again, I appreciate the opportunity to get to be with you all today. It's been nice to get to visit with people and visit with family this afternoon and eat a lot of good food and watch Harper pick up eggs so that I can eat all the candy that's inside of it because she's still too small to eat too much of that candy. I told her she should have picked up the eggs that had more of the candies in it that I like, but she just didn't really care about nothing like that. So I appreciate you all having me here and, and, and only hope the best for you all as I understand you all are going to be starting to look for new preacher coming up soon, and if I can be of any help in any of that through that, uh, I'm, I'm more than willing to be happy to help in any way. Today there seems to be much confusion over the concept of love. We overuse it sometimes, we misuse it, and then there's also the not using it at all. We think that it's something that just happens, like catching a cold, and that there isn't much you can do about it. When you got it, you got it. Our media tells us all kinds of things, such as you can fall in and out of love very easily. So it's, it's just something that you feel. Or the idea of love at first sight. Or that love's just something that comes easy and you don't have to work at. When the reality is completely opposite from that, isn't it? The reality is, is falling in and out is a decision that people make. It's not just love magically coming and going. Feelings come because of a love that develops. An interest can be had at first sight. Or it might be the opposite of love that we're going to be talking about tonight. It might be lust. Because love is something that develops as you go along. Love is most certainly something that you work at. And I want us to think about this idea of love versus lust tonight. I use that idea of wheat or the tares. Because if you remember that story that Jesus tells, that parable, it's very hard to tell the difference sometimes between the wheat and the tares until it comes time for the harvest, until it comes time for the reaping. And then it's too late when you get to mix those two in there. They can look very similar, but the reality is, is they are very different. You do not want your tares sown among the wheat. And I would argue the same thing whenever it comes to love. You don't want your understanding of love to have sown in it poor understanding. To have sown in it the idea of lust. And one of the stories that we're going to use tonight is it winds up not having a very nice ending to it, but I think it hopefully drives the point home. If you'll turn over to 2 Samuel chapter 13. 2 Samuel chapter 13, that's where we're going to start at tonight. And we're going to look at this idea... And this story that is written here about one of David's sons that commits a very wicked act with, well, wouldn't you know it, one of his daughters. We're going to start in verse 1. We're going to read a few verses, talk about it, set some stages, and then we'll read a little bit further on. Verses 1 through 6 is where we'll begin now it was after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a beautiful sister whose name was Tamar. And Amnon, the son of David, loved her. Amnon was so frustrated because of his sister Tamar that he made himself ill. For she was a virgin and it seemed hard to Amnon to do anything to her. But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shema, David's brother. And Jonadab was a very shrewd man, and he said to him, O oh, son of the king, why are you so depressed, morning after morning? Will you not tell me? Then Amnon said to him, I am in love with Tamar, the sister of my brother Absalom. Jonadab then said to him, Lie down on your bed and pretend to be ill. When your father comes to see you, say to him, Please let my sister Tamar come and give me some food to eat, and let her prepare the food in my sight, that I may see it and eat from her hand. So Amnon lay down and pretended to be ill. When the king came to see him, Amnon said to the king, Please let my sister Tamar come and make me a couple of cakes in my sight, that I may eat from her hand. So to begin with, as we stated, gross, right? Disgusting. This is not at all what we would think about doing in our society today. It's his sister, right? It's his half-sister. It's weird to begin with, but, 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 listen, listen. He believes that he's in love. He is
is even sick with love. He's really feeling. Let me tell you something. Our world would hear all of this and maybe they wouldn't get too focused on the sister part. And oh, Let's just be perfectly honest with the direction that we're going. I think a lot of people in our society more and more would say, well, he is in love. You know what you feel. And it says, the Bible says, the Bible says he felt it. But was it really that? And he felt it so much that he had to have her. Whether she wanted it or not, he had to have her. And so they develop a plan. And this is not a devised plan to try to get her in a very general region so that he could ask her out on a date. No, this is a plan to trap her. My question is, is does this sound like love? Does it sound like love? Doesn't to me. Not so far, but if you listen to the world, they would probably say, well, yeah, I have no reason not to think that. Okay. We'll continue reading on, verse 7 and 14. Then David sent to the house of Tamar, saying, Go now to your brother Amnon's house and prepare food for him. So Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house, and he was laying down, and she took dough, kneaded it, made cakes in his sight, and baked the cakes. She took the pan and dished them out before him, but he refused to eat. And Amnon said, Have everyone go out from me. So everyone went out from him. Then Amnon said to Tamar, Bring the food into the bedroom that I may eat from your hand. So Tamar took the cakes which she had made and brought them into the bedroom to her brother Amnon. When she brought them to him to eat, he took hold of her and said to her, Come lie with me, my sister. But she answered him, No, my brother, do not violate me, for such a thing is not done in Israel. Do not do this disgraceful thing. As for me, where could I get rid of my reproach? As for you, you will be like one of the fools in Israel. Now, therefore, please speak to the king, for he will not withhold me from you. However, he would not listen to her. Since he was stronger than she, he violated her and lay with her. Well, his plan goes through, doesn't it? He gets accomplished what he wanted to get accomplished. And when you really look at this part of the story... He was the one that it was said that he was feeling love. Oh, he was a lovesick. But who's the one that's showing love in this case? It's that half-sister in it. It's that half-sister coming and doing things for him. She was being so kind to him, so helpful when he is sick. And he couldn't just leave it at that, but he propositioned her. Obviously, she did not want that. And so then he forced her and violated her. Does that sound like love? Well, now at this point of the story, I think most people in our society anymore would say, okay, no. No, that that wasn't love. He was mistaken. But he felt it, right? He thought that it was. He was convinced that it was. But it wasn't that at all. I think it's pretty easy for us to see right now that it was the first thing, was it not? It was lust. It was not love. Continue to read on. Then Amnon hated her with a very great hatred, for the hatred with which he hated her was greater than love which he had loved her. And Amnon said to her, Go up, go away. Get up, go away. But she said to him, No, because this wrong in sending me away is greater than the other that you have done to me. Yet he would not listen to her. Then he called his young men who attended him and said, Now throw this woman out of my presence and lock the door behind her. Now she had on a long sleeved garment, for in this manner the virgin daughters of the king dressed themselves in robes. Then his attendants took her out and locked the door behind her. Tamar put ashes on her head and tore her long sleeved garment, which was on her, and she put and she put her hand on her head and went away, crying aloud as she went. Now we see it for what it is. How could this person go from being so full of love to now so full of hate? And not just that he just was annoyed by her. It says that he hated her and he felt it more than he did the original love. How could that be? Well, I'll tell you how it could be. It's because he's going off of selfish emotions And he don't really understand what love actually is. He was going off of lust, and he was not going off of love. And he goes on just not to do that act, which is very disgraceful, but he goes on to continue to disgrace her. 
and put her out. No love at all. He goes from love sick to full of hate and despise. And folks, the first point I want to make off of this, when we let our selfish emotions guide us, they can take us anywhere. They can take us anywhere. Folks, emotion tells you what you're feeling. It does not tell you if you should be feeling it. That's a big difference from the world. Because right now, so many people says, if it feels right, do it. If you feel like this is the right thing, then it is to you. He felt like that was the right thing for him, but it was not. And even he understood that afterwards. we got to get out of this mindset that whatever we feel must be right because that's not truth. It's never been truth, and it's definitely not truth in this case. You need to make very rash, wise decisions. And for us as Christians, as we talked about all this morning... Be making decisions based off the will of God, based off the word of God, and not opposite from Him. Well, not only does this go on to cause her problems, but if we go through and read the rest of this chapter, what we're going to find out is he's going to die because of his treachery. That's another point to be made. All these emotions, you may think that they will eventually lead to nothing much. It's not really that big a deal. I thought I was in love, but I actually want no big deal. Well, there could be some serious repercussions that happen because of that. And we can't let that happen. That could have been greatly avoided if he would have actually loved her and just appreciated the things he'd done and let her go on away. But when sin gets involved, problems arise. And so some lessons and some passages I want us to think about. I want us to think about this idea that when you think about 1 John and you think about verses 2, verses 15 through 17, it reads like this, Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father but is from the world. The world will pass away and also its lust, but the one who does the will of God forever or lives forever. Lust is of the world. Love is of God. They are opposed to one another. And so as we thought through this, we we first see that love is conceived, right? In his mind it is. In his mind he thinks that he loved her. We saw that in those first few verses there. Then he saw that love realized, didn't he? No, he just thought that he did. He thought that he had the right understanding. And then he goes on to see, well, love actually was non-existent. We need to have a better understanding of what love means. And that's what I want us to spend the rest of this time talking about. I want us to look at some lessons, look at some passages, and kind of look at this idea of love versus lust. What does the Bible say about one versus the other? Why are they so closely tied yet so vastly different. And I think we're going to be able to come back to a very easy point with that, and that's dealing with sin. But we'll get there. We'll get there. And so the first point that I want to make is that whenever it comes from love versus lust, love is something developed. Love is something that comes from God. It's not something that is just easily developed, or excuse me, it is not something that just easily happens or is obtained. Anything developed lasts longer and means more than it does in the instant. We think about the idea of love for brethren and how love takes thought. It takes dedication. I think about Brad Paisley's song whenever he sings, I thought I loved her then. Are you a person trying to develop a loving attitude? Are you a person that is not in the least bit. Are we looking to mimic what love looks like or are we looking to actually understand it? Because it doesn't take much for lust. Lust in a relationship can be more than just sexual in in nature. I think a lot of times that's where we go with that automatically. That's what we tie that to. But you can lust after someone's money. 
You can lust after someone's wealth, someone's position, someone's abilities. And it can develop too. Just like love. But true love, true love is tied to God. Whereas lust is tied to the world. Look with me over in 1 John 4. John is full of, of speaking about love. And people love that about John. Huh, interestingly enough. Love that about the book of 1 John. But there's so many times where I don't think we try to really grasp some of the points that John is making in this book. In chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, John says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God is love. This is where love comes from. And may I make the point, if you think that you're understanding love and that it's not lust, then that means that God is there in that relationship. Because if God is not there in that relationship, if you're in a dating relationship, if you're in a marriage relationship, you probably don't have a very good understanding of love. At least not something that can be fully developed. Because God is love. What about 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 17? Thinking about that passage again, I already put it up there on the screen to begin this sermon with, but I'll reference it again in this setting. When you think about that passage and you think about where lust comes from, it comes from the world. It comes from Satan. So if you're finding that kind of stuff going on in your life, if you're finding that kind of pride going on in your life, then you're recognizing that God is not in that relationship as He should be. Because that's not love. But we mix those two up so often. If it's truly love, then God's going to be there. If it's truly love, then there's going to be no selfishness. Think about 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 4 through, well, 4 through 6 here. Love is patient. Love is kind and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. Does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with truth. When you read a passage like that, do you see selfishness or selflessness in that passage? Folks, I'm here to tell you, whether you're married, whether you're dating, whether you're getting ready to start that arena of your life or you're in between boyfriends or whatever the case may be, you've got to understand, if love is truly there, then selflessness is truly there. And we always love to make these points to our young people before they get married. And I think rightfully so to be talking about, hey, just because that boy tells you that he loves you, if he's being selfish all the time, if he's wanting things from you that you are not going to give him and shouldn't give him, that he don't really love you. And I think that's absolutely so. But let me tell you something. Just because you may start that way in a marriage... That doesn't mean that you're continuing that end of the bargain as well for you. And that's something that all of us have to remember, that if love is truly there, if it's truly deepening like that song that Brad Paisley sings, I thought I loved her at the end, and every step of the way, every step of life, he gets a better understanding and a better understanding of what love means, you need to be working on that. Because love is something that grows. Love is something tied to selflessness as opposed to selfishness. And this passage right here is used oftentimes in marriage ceremonies. And I do want to make sure that I don't take this out of context and I want to stress, this passage right here is not talking about a husband and a wife. It is talking about a brother and sister in Christ. It is talking about a brother towards a brother. But may I make a suggestion to you? Should that not be your spouse as well? What, what part of this is not something that you should be towards your spouse? This is about love towards all. Do you see the selflessness in these words? Does it sound thought out? 
Does it sound uniform? Because I don't. Th- I, I think people forget that this isn't reserved for people in love, but that this is actually character that develops in you to be a loving character. So if this is in you or your boyfriend, your fiancé, your husband, your girlfriend, your wife, then that's telling you something about love. That's telling you something about them. Because if it's not, then that's also telling you something about where they're at. And, and it's not to suggest that if someone is lacking in these that they can't straighten up, that they can't change. But you better make sure that they're working on that before you let yourself get way too involved in something that you shouldn't. Because if it's actions that only seem to be directed towards you, when it might not even be directed towards other people, that may be evidence that they don't understand love. I don't know how many times have people fail to see that. He treats me so well. He's so good to me, but he's horrible to his mama. He, he's horrible to his teachers at school. He's horrible to his bosses and everyone else. Or she. Maybe they don't have a good grasp of what love actually is. Maybe they really need to grow in that. And while obviously the love between a man and a woman is going to be different from this, this still needs to be there because this is selflessness. This is a relationship void of these things. This really begs the question if love is actually there or if it's ever going to grow there. Because when you think about this list, you think about love being patient because Love is patient. You think about God. How how does that show off in our relationship with God? What about His long-sufferingness? Are we ever thankful that God didn't just let us die like this all of a sudden? That He's given us this opportunity? Because right now, as you still have a breath, you have an opportunity. That's love from God. That He has given you an opportunity to make things right. He's given you an opportunity to be here right now. Love is patient, whereas lust is impulsive. Very much in the minute, very much from one moment to the next, I don't care, just whatever. That's lust. That's no thought behind that. But love is patient. Love is selfless, where lust is selfish, as we've talked about. What does this describe? How is this describing you and your relationships with people? Love forgives where lust fails to forget. What does that sound like? That sounds like what should be said about Christians at every turn of the way, that we are ready to forgive people, that we are ready to move past things, but the world world never forgets. If you said something on Twitter 10 years ago, I don't even know if Twitter was around 10 years ago, but if you said something on Twitter 10 years ago when you were 12, now all of a sudden you're 22 and you're you're in some kind of public eye and people want to hold you accountable for something you did when you was 12. And we look at that, I would imagine most of us here, and we roll our eyes at that, like, come on people, can't you understand that people have changed, that that was written by a child, that that was written by someone else? But Twitter don't care. People don't care. They don't forget. Especially when you're out for something that you want, and that's the whole reason why you're bringing it up to begin with. It always seems like there's an agenda behind stuff like that. There's always some kind of selfish agenda as to why you won't be willing to forgive somebody. Do you realize that? What is keeping you from living that kind of lifestyle as opposed to the other? And one of the big ones that I really want to stress right here is this idea that love, well, love rejoices in righteousness. Whereas lust doesn't let that get in the way at all. There's no clearer picture of that than when you think about Romans chapter 1 and you read through that passage and how much of it is talking about the dishonor that is created when people lead lustful lives and lead lives away from God and they go off into their passions and their degrading passions as it says over there. We'll, we'll read a little bit of that in verse 24. Therefore God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them for they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. 
For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. For their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way also, the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire towards one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving their own person, uh, excuse me, and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. It's a misunderstanding between love and lust. This is, this is exactly what we still see going on today. And this is not anybody trying to hurt people and hurt people's feelings. It's not about feelings at all. That's kind of my point. It's about what does God call what. And it's pretty plain right here that when God looks at these kinds of relationships, these homosexual relationships, he calls them degrading, unnatural, indecent, in saying that they receive their due penalty. But that passage don't just stop right here going there, but it goes a little bit further into where lust takes you. Because when you're a lustful person, it's just not in that kind of arena, but it's also in other arenas of your life. If you go on to read this passage, it talks about things such as envy. It talks about things such as lying, deceiving, gossiping, just unloving behavior and unmerciful behavior. Calling these as well worthy of death. Why? Because these actions are opposite of love. They're lustful. They're seeking after what you want, when you want it, and why you want it. And this is not the way that we should live our lives. This is not the way that we're called on to do. And so, we need to think about what we need to do. In James chapter 4, verses 7 through 10, James says this here, Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your, heart, uh, your hearts, you double-minded. For miserable and, uh, be miserable and mourn, and weep, and let your laughter be turned into mourning, and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. We need to flee. We need to get away from these kinds of mindsets, from these kinds of passions. When you think about what is said over to Timothy when he's told to flee youthful lust, a lot of times when we hear that passage and we hear that phrasing, we think of it more or less like it's saying, hey youth, flee lust. But that ain't what that passage is meaning. It's calling lust a youthful thing. In other words, he's saying, that's what a child would do. You're an adult. You should not be doing these things. You need to flee when those youthful desires happen. Folks, it's stuff that we still get caught up in. It's stuff that we still have to stay away from. It is stuff that is forbidden. Christ makes the point over in Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 through 28. Speaking there in, the, in very sexual language, Christ makes it clear that that kind of relationship, that kind of mindset is wrong. It is wrong to lust after someone. It's as if you've already committed adultery in your hearts with them. Don't do it. One is forbidden. One is commanded. Even you think about the, the, the husband and the wife, Ephesians 5.33, the husband is commanded to love the wife. But much the same way, and I think this is telling in Titus chapter 2, he commands Titus to talk to the older women to teach the younger women to love their husbands. Well, huh, ain't that kind of interesting? They had to be taught to love their husbands. So maybe it isn't some kind of magical Disney thing to where it automatically just happens. But it's something that you grow to learn. It's something that you grow in understanding of. Because when you fail to do that, when you fail to grow in those kinds of understandings, then it leads to bad decisions whenever it comes to lust. Lust leads to things like what we read about tonight. Taking advantage of someone. Lust leads to pornography. Lust leads to premarital sex issues. And you understand why that's wrong, those of you that's in the audience, right? Hopefully we understand that now. That person doesn't belong to you. They don't belong to you. That's why you don't do that. And most of us could probably tell you, 
anybody that has allowed themselves to go that stage can tell you why that would hurt and why that would cause problems in your life. It can lead to poor marriage decisions. I remember hearing someone tell someone before whenever he was struggling with, with, with temptations of this nature and he said, well, the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 7, 9, marry and don't burn with passion. And so that was his advice in this case is, oh, you're struggling with you and your girlfriend. Y'all just need to get married. That ain't what that passage is saying. Paul's not using marriage as a cure for lust. He's not doing that. He's not doing that in that passage. What Paul is doing in that passage, he's saying marriage is where that belongs. You don't have those kind of drives. You fight against those kind of drives until you're ready to get married. Don't go get married just so that you can put it in its proper place. That's not what he's saying right there. Don't get caught up by what you think is love when in reality it could be lust. Whereas love, love leads to good decisions. It leads to us caring for one another. The very lesson that we talked about this morning, and I won't be belabor this too much because we talked about it, those final few points that we talked about, when you love your brethren, when you love your spouse, when you love whoever, when we're talking about love in that, in that grand arena and not just in the marriage relationship, but it also definitely applies there, when you see someone sick, you're going to go help them. That's the kind of decisions that that leads to. When you're sick and somebody loves you, they come and help you. If it's all about lust, then they ain't got no time for that. Because it's all about them. They're not going to come to see you. They're not going to take care of you because it's not benefiting them any. Unless they are doing it for some kind of benefiting case. You hold doors for people when you think about marriage. You hold hands with one another. You cook with one another. You do those small things that people talk about. That's what love leads to. It doesn't happen in lust. It happens because of pure love. Folks, both of these things are decisions. Neither just happens. And we've got to remember that. When we're looking at this idea of love and lust, and we could break this down even further. I hope to just give you some kind of taste about what different ones of the scriptures have to say about this subject because it goes deeper and deeper, as deep as you want to find it in here. So how are you in your relationships with people in general? Do you find yourself being a lustful person or a loving person? Do you find yourself being a person that is seeking out for their own well-being Way more often than you're seeking out for the well-being of others. That's probably letting you know what kind of character you are. If it's lustful, we need to recognize something. We need to repent of that. We need to repent of the actions and we need to repent. And, and you understand what it means to repent, right? It's not just say that you're sorry, but it's to be sorry. It's to change. It's to get those passions. It's to get that drive out of your life and put love in its place. Put love in its place. Stop living for yourself and live for Jesus. If you're a loving person, then that means that you have gotten lustful ideas out of your head and you've started to look at for what you can do for others. And I commend you for that. I, I say continue on that. And don't just rest on your laurels that that's the way you've been, but you keep pushing for that. You keep looking for people to help. You keep thinking about, well, how can I encourage that person? How can I encourage this person? Because that's what's going to keep you growing strong. And we all recognize we need those people in our lives. We need to be those people back to other people in their lives. That's the beauty of a church. That's the beauty of a church family that I'm looking around at right now that you can do so much for one another. They can have so much an impact on one another. And not only that, but we had two ladies here just this morning and whenever I was talking to them, they said uh, how well that you treated Miss Crowder. They just, they just really wanted to be here this morning to be with you all. Because you had that much of an impact on her, it then had an impact on them. Never sell short the small things that you can do for people. Because you never know just how much it's going to impact them and just how much it will impact others. When you do those kinds of things, then you truly are letting your light so shine among men that they may see your good deeds and not glorify you, but glorify God in heaven. 
Because that's love. That's what love leads to. If you're here tonight and you've been living a life of lust, you've been living a life for yourself, now's the time to change. I would ask you really where has that gotten you? And maybe you hadn't hit any kind of rock bottom at this point in your life. Maybe you haven't hit any great difficulties, but odds are you will. You will. As Bassus talks about living that kind of life with the world, the world's going to be all about that and they're going to leave you just as soon as they can. Just as soon as they ain't getting what they want from you, they're going to be done with you. You think about the prodigal son, that's exactly what happened with him. He left something good. He left the Lord. He left the love that he had for his father, from his father, from his brother, from that whole life that he had going on there. He forsook something solid like love in pursuit of lust. In pursuit of lust. How many of us do the same thing? How many of us have such a grand opportunity sitting all around us right now but then we allow lustful things to get in our minds and get in our lives and get us sideways. There are people that you're going to walk out the store and come into contact with that they need this brought to their attention. They need it brought to their attention that they're living lives full of lust and are not living lives full of love. One comes from God, one comes from Satan. One can lead to eternal life if you will continue to see it through as it actually is. True righteousness and one will only lead to a life with Satan. A life void of God, which in and of itself should be something that disturbs each and every one of us. If you're here tonight and we can help you in any way, we ask that you come now as we stand and as we sing.